So thanks very much. Uh, this, I think, is the third, the third in the little series that I've been giving um, about butterflies of the previous years. So let's move on. So obviously, <clears throat> if you're a member of Butterfly Conservation, you will have received a copy of our uh, annual report. And some of what I'm going to say is obviously included in that annual report. But hopefully I can talk around uh, the topic a bit. And also I will be covering in the second half of the talk um, a bit of information about moths. And I will be picking out certain species of the butterflies. I'm not going to go through every single species in Hertfordshire and Middlesex. And then obviously the, but the moth bit will be even more selective because we've got so many moths um, that, could, that could be talked about. So let's uh, move along. So let's just have a look at the numbers and where we get our records from. And it's quite interesting in that you can see now records that people put in on iRecord are by far the largest contributor to our database. Um, and in fact, if you look at the casual records and branch website records below, they still only they total just about 11,000, whereas iRecord's up to 17,000. So this is a big increase in people using these electronic um, systems to put on records, which actually makes life much easier for me because I look at them most days and either um, approve them or put a query on or one or two can't be dealt with at all for various reasons. It's interesting, it says iRecord, but iRecord now actually pulls in records from a whole range of sources as iRecord, iNaturalist, BTO's bird track, um, the garden butterfly survey. So it's becoming incre an increasingly important source for records. And um, yeah, I'm very happy for people to put records in that way if it's convenient for them to do so. You can see that uh, big butterfly count records <clears throat> was a smaller number this year. Um, that is partly accounted for by the weather, which I'll talk about a bit in a, in a minute or two. Still got plenty of transect records. We had um, a large number of <clears throat> transect record, uh, transects walked last year, just over 80, which is something of a, a record from uh, memory. And uh, obviously they are very valuable. I also directly applied to the BTO for their garden bird watch records, which we don't come through automatically. And that supplies um, another good tranche of records and uh, a few come through from the wider countryside butterfly as well survey. So we actually had over 50,000 records received. Um, smaller number of recorders this year. I think that's down to a smaller number of big butterfly count records, but it's still a lot of people sending in records. So that, that's great. Thank you to everyone in this audience or who will be watching the um, online versions who sent in records. Believe me, they're all appreciated, even if it's just one record of a large white or something like that. So where are our records made or not made? So this chart on the left you'll have seen in the annual report, and it shows um, the hot spots in terms of the number of species that have been recorded in each two centimetre square throughout Hertfordshire and Middlesex. Um, and the plan is always to get rid of as many of the purple and blue uh, squares as we can and concentrate on green and if possible yellow and the various shades of red up into deep maroon because they are the squares with, with the most butterflies. But clearly the ones at the top are sometimes going to be some of the best areas for butterflies. So you can see the maroon around Albury Noah's on the left hand side. You can see a lot of red spots uh, in East Hertfordshire where there's a lot of recording goes on and where there's woodlands like Bull's Wood. Um, and Broxbourne Woods and up in the north around uh, Thurfield Heath. So they're always going to be the spots that record the most. But if you look on the right, you can see the white spots on the left hand map are actually picked out in uh, colours on the right. And you can see that there are still some areas which aren't well recorded. And um, I'm very happy if anyone wants guidance, if they think there's a square near them, to, to where it'd be great if you just go out and have a look for butterflies, even you know, just go out for a walk in the summer or the spring and just record what you see. Because some of these squares, which have nothing in at the moment for the last three years worth of recording, there must be some butterflies there, even if it's only a few of the very common species. A lot of the uh, blanker areas are actually right on the edge of the county. And it may be that only a tiny part of Hertfordshire 
or Middlesex is actually included in that particular square, which may be explain the under recording. But you see there are quite a few areas in northeast Hertfordshire and also a chunk in what you might call central west Hertfordshire, which are well within the county um, and no one seems to go to them. Um, a lot of the ones in the northeast are within what's called, we often refer to as the arable desert. But there are plenty of footpaths through those areas. There are woodlands in those areas. And there's some often some quite interesting field edges. So, you know, still yourself to walk through acres of oilseed rape or winter wheat. You may come across a few gems hidden amongst them where hedges have been retained or there's some good field edges. And there may be interesting things there, but because very few people visit, we just don't know about. And I should have brought that map up on the left earlier. That just compares that map with the sort of main built up areas in the town to give some sort of context to, um, to those other two maps. So what were the weather effects? Well, I think it's fair to say that we had unusual weather. Hopefully it's unusual, but uh, it may not be given the changes in the climate and weather we're seeing in 2022. It was a very dry year. It was a very warm year, especially in uh, mid and late July and into August when we had those record temperatures, the days up around very close to 40 degrees. And then things evened out a bit more as we went into the autumn. But what is noticeable for a lot of species is the weather had significant impact on them. On these charts, just to explain, the black bar bars are what happened. And I know it says 2021 there, it should say 2022. That's for a mistake when I was putting these together. And compared to the average flights in uh, 2005 to 2014, and if the black bars exceed the right hand side of the orange line considerably, it means that things were flying later. And if they're on the left hand side considerably, it means they were flying earlier. And something odd has happened here. This is the wrong set of maps. So um, <clears throat> anyway, forget, I don't know how many, I'm sure when I checked it, it was OK. But anyway, what I wanted to point out was but a lot of species reached a peak quite early in the year with the warm, dry conditions. They were flying earlier. And then after mid-July, things went, went off the edge of a cliff and several species like Red Admiral and Comma were only recorded in tiny amounts in the late summer and autumn when normally you'd expect them to be peaking. And similarly with a speck of wood, which would normally peak in late August and September, the hot, dry weather really did affect larval development and emergence of later broods. And so they were actually flying much earlier in the year. So let's move on to a few of the species. I've picked out about a dozen of species to say a little bit about. So the Duke of Burgundy, we were got very excited in 2021 because there were four sightings, all from Albury Noahs, the uh, Wildlife Trust Reserve on the west western side of Hertfordshire. This year, there was only one sighting. We've, Malcolm and I spent some time with various volunteers from BC and from the Wildlife Trust and with Nick Bowles, who you'll be able to hear on um, Saturday, looking at the site and looking at the cowslip leaves and the position of the cowslip leaves and wondering if there's more that could be done to encourage the Duke of Burgundy to actually establish a colony, because as you're probably aware, it's, it has colonies just over the border into the Buckinghamshire at places like Inchcombe Hole, um, only, a, only a couple of miles north of Albury Noahs. Um, it's still work in progress. The problem is that the requirements for the Duke of Burgundy are actually very different to the requirements for many of the other chalk loving butterflies for which places like Albury Noahs um, are better suited and for which it has SSI designation which can cause difficulties in actually creating habitat which is suitable for the Duke of Burgundy which likes much damper longer grass conditions with um, large large leaves often in a bit of shade uh, of, of the um, <coughs> cowslips which doesn't fit in very well with grassland management but we, we have hopes that it will spread into the county uh, it's always been a little bit marginal in Hertfordshire but you never know. But uh, that's that was the situation with that. So disappointing, 
but uh, we'll see what this year brings. With the amount of rain, one would hope that the uh, cow slips may be growing very lushly this year. Um, right, the brown hair streak. This is obviously one of the success stories of um, 2020, of the 2020s or the, the most recent years. And you can see that in 2022 compared to 2021, it was actually recorded at quite a few more sites. And I think it's difficult to know whether it is actually spreading to some of these sites or whether this is just increased recorder activity. More people looking for eggs, more people actually going out and looking for the adults during the late summer. But I mean, the good news is it's now quite well distributed in West Hertfordshire, uh, sorry, in West Middlesex, yet to quite cross the border into Hertfordshire, which is a great shame, but we will have high hopes that it will find some habitat that it likes. Um, it seems to, given its northward spread, it can't be that long, surely, because it's not as if Hertfordshire doesn't have lots of blackthorn. So keep your eyes open in the late summer for this butterfly, which although like many hair streaks, flies high a lot of the time, it will come down to flowers as the middle illustration shows. <clears throat> and when it does come down to flowers, it, it will quite often rest and nectar for quite long periods of time. The small blue, um, another success, this one hasn't yet made it into Middlesex, but is being recorded increasingly in Hertfordshire. We have found that a lot of farmers, particularly in the north of the county around Albury Noahs, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, around uh, Royston, have been planting fields or field edges with uh, kidney vetch, which is its sole larval food plant. Um, and we have found when we've gone and examined these uh, farms, many of which are, are private, so we've actually got permission to do surveys on, on the farmer's land, Virtually all on virtually all the land where there is kidney veg, we have found evidence of small blues, which which is great news. Even sometimes quite isolated in islands in the middle of fields, um, they've also spread uh, down into into areas like Cloth, the area north of Clothall Common alongside the A505. So there are a number of areas where you can go and see them, as well as classic sites like Hillbrow, just outside Letchworth. So we do, ha do have concerns despite our best efforts with, about the uh, maintenance of that site. And we, we have spent some time talking to the Letchworth Garden City Heritage Trust about management there. And they are very, very receptive when you talk to them. But I'm afraid without the you know, majority of deeds don't always um, follow the words. Let's put it that way. But they are they are still there, and hopefully they are going to continue spreading. Obviously, they're, they're going to be limited because kidney vetch is very much restricted to chalky areas. Though, as you'll hear, I suspect from Mike on Saturday, it doesn't have to be pure chalk or pure limestone for kidney vetch to survive, as long as there is some degree of chalkiness or alkalinity in the soil. There is um, a chance of kidney vetch growing. And with it increasingly included in seed mixes, I'm hopeful that we may see um, further spread of this delightful little butterfly. So the speckled wood, yeah. So this is this is actually the correct flight chart, and this actually points out what I was saying. Normally, as you can see, late August or early September, there would be a peak which is being built up to gradually through the year because the speckled wood has a number of overlapping breeds broods um, because of its habit of spending the winter in two different states. So they emerge um, over time from, I, from whichever state they spent overwintering, either as a chrysalis or as a caterpillar. So they tend to be around all, all, the, all the summer long. But you can see what happened last year. There were peaks during spring when we had that very mild weather, and there were peaks in the early summer, again, following all the mild weather. But then they fell away very quickly, much more quickly than usual in the autumn. And there was nothing like the usual peak in the autumn. Um, so the distribution of it was, was, was still pretty good. Now, the dark green fritillary, um, I particularly want to point up um, an interesting thing here. 
You can see that in 2012, it was very much restricted to what you might call some major Chalkland sites, which were Albury Noah's, Exton Chalk Pit, and around Thurfield Heath. And you can see it's still present in all those areas, though with more dots in each of those cases. So, but what's interesting is that over the past couple of years, there've been a couple of reports of just single or one or two dark green fritillaries at a site in East Hertfordshire. And um, I went up there this year following a couple of other reports and found that along this field edge, along the road from Watnut Stone to Walken, and that's the big red, that's the, the red blob in the middle of Hertfordshire. And this is a picture of that field edge. There is quite a lot of chalky grassland and there were dozens of dark green fritillaries. And there is another private site nearby um, where there were even more dozens of dark green fritillaries and other people have been up there and got counts in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s of dark green fritillary. So we have a very strong um, colony of dark green fritillary on this small area of exposed chalkland. You can see it's on quite a, a steep hillside above the River Bean. Um, and they tend to favour steep hillsides. Um, and they, what it looks like is they may be breeding in this private land, but popping over the road and the hedge into this chalk uh, field edge, where there's been a lot of um, knapweed planted, which is one of their favourite nectar plants. You can see one nectaring in, in the middle picture. Now, the question is, has this colony always been there, which seems unlikely because I've been up that field edge for quite a few years and not seen any sign of them in the past, or has it naturally spread there very recently, given that it uh, seems to be more common in the county, but it's a big jump across a lot of unlikely habitat, or is it another introduction? The answer is we just don't know, but it's worth looking for dark green fritillaries anywhere where there's a bit of chalk has come to the surface, it seems to me. There may be other hidden colonies, and especially up in the northeast of the county, as you go up again towards more chalk areas, maybe there are hidden colonies on, on field edges up there. And it would be great if people would go up there and have a look because it's a superb butterfly. And it's not a common butterfly in Hartshire. It's not that common a butterfly generally. And it would be wonderful if we could find more colonies of it. The white admiral is a species of uh, considerable concern. It's uh, declining nationally, um, and certainly that decline, if you look at the 2021 map down at the bottom there, you can see there were a lot of empty spaces in 2021. 2022 up above shows that it actually managed to make something of a comeback in, um, in the last year. Now, obviously, its flight period is nowadays most of June, apart from the first week and into July. So it probably got cut off by the very hot weather, but the, the very mild, down, uh, very mild spring may have encouraged the uh, breeding success. And it's seen a lot more woods, for instance, Whippendale Woods near Watford, it was a lot more common. Um, it was recorded again, if I remember rightly, in Simon's Hyde Wood, where it hadn't been seen in 2021 in central Hertfordshire, and there were certainly more reports in the Broxbourne Woods complex. So maybe um, it, ha it isn't quite as threatened as, as we thought it might be. But it'll be very interesting this summer to see how it's managed to breed, whether it managed to breed successfully given the very hot period at the end of its flight period, um, and how many of its, its larvae have managed to survive through what was a much colder winter. So of course, they should be well adapted to survive frosts and cold winters and how much they, they should be enjoying in this mild weather, the, the abundant um, leaf growth on the honeysuckle. The Red Admiral is a very graphic exact, uh, illustration of what I mentioned earlier when I had the wrong weather charts, up, flight charts up. It was very much recorded all the way through May, June, July. And as soon as that hot weather came, you can see the numbers plummeted. And basically, the homebred brood that flies in September and October, and is usually so evident on things like ivy, was in very short supply. I very rarely saw more than one or two at a time, whereas sometimes you can see dozens and dozens on big stands of ivy in the autumn. Um, so 
who, know, who knows what's happened. There certainly haven't been many records of them flying during the winter. He's had probably the smallest number of records in December, January, February of Red Admirals that we've had for many, many years. So there have been the odd one. But whether we're going to have to wait for it to, to be bulked up by migration almost completely this year, rather than the homebred um, species overwintering uh, remains to be seen. The comma, which is obviously often spends time with the Red Admiral was on the ivy in the autumn, had a similar drop off. You can see there was a reasonable spring population. They bred well and we got a summer population which flew earlier than usual. But the numbers dropped off even more perhaps than the Red Admiral. And basically, the, the brood which emerges to fly in September and into October was almost absent. I've only seen one comma this year, and um, there have been very few records coming through on iRecord, certainly. So how many of them have managed to hibernate over the over the winter? Uh, I'm not sure. But again, it will. I suspect they may have to uh, build up again during the summer. Let's hope that any that did survive managed to breed well this spring. Certainly, and I don't want to keep reiterating this, but the mildish weather we've had recently, I know we've had some cold spells, but the mild damp weather should certainly be encouraging nettles to grow well. So there ought to be plenty of food plant for uh, things like the Red Admiral and the Comma, should they be around to take advantage of them. The green hair streak is really concentrated in two particular areas, uh, southwest Hertfordshire on Heathland, and you can see in 2022, we had uh, more records than we did in uh, 2021. Uh, nice, nice thick block there in the uh, Hounslow Heath and surrounding areas. And then it was seen in the usual areas, Hexton Chalk Pit, Albury Noahs, um, as usual. But also there was one record from Thurfield Heath, which you think would be a good area for it. It's uh, chalk, chalk land, very much the same as the other two Chalkland sites, but it's very rarely been recorded up there. So hopefully there will be more, more of them occurring uh, up there this year. Who knows? It does have a tendency to appear in odd places well away from the known uh, distribution. If you look at the 2021 map, you can see there are records in odd places. For instance, Alexandra Palace Park is that one uh, towards the east of Middlesex. But there were no, apart from that Albury No, sorry, I beg your Thurfield Heath one, there were no um, extra limit or records at all in uh, 2022. That's quite interesting. I, I don't know what to make of that. Cloudy yellow, uh, another of our migrants, um, had a pretty good year in 2022. It certainly wasn't a cloudy yellow year in the way it was, I think, in 2000 when they were everywhere and you could see dozens of them forming breeding colonies. But there were certainly good numbers seen, you can see very much compared to 2021. So this was quite a successful year for this attractive migrant, uh, which is quite easy to identify when it's in flight because <clears throat> it actually gives a much more orangey yellow appearance than uh, brimstones, which are a similar size. And obviously it's a much more rounded looking butterfly. <clears throat> it seems to be particularly encouraged by fields which are grown of clover, which you can see on the bottom left, and lucerne, which you can see on the bottom right. Both these uh, food plant, both these plants are food plants for the caterpillars, um, and they are actually very attractive to the flowers. Clearly, with these being crops which can be cut and come again, especially lucerne, which might be harvested four or five times in the year, whether they really successfully manage to ever breed on these uh, plants is uh, is debatable. They may have more success on things like the bird's foot trefoil in the centre of the picture. It's difficult that they, they've never been known really to survive the winter in any particular stage, apart from right down in the southwest. So we'll probably have to wait to see how many migrants there are coming in this year. Um, and they can fluctuate so much from year to year. But 2022 was one of the best recent years. Common blue. Um, it's interesting. This is another one that we've been very concerned about. And you can see in 2021, there were, were a lot of gaps in its distribution. Whereas in 2022, um, a lot of those gaps seem to be filled in. You can see there's plenty still of open rings, um, suggesting that there are some spaces still for it still to be recorded. 
and there's still some big white gaps where it may well be present. We're not quite sure why it fluctuates so much, given that it, its uh, breeding plant is bird's foot trefoil, which is very well distributed across both Hertfordshire and Middlesex. So it's undergoing some fluctuations, um, and it, it's not quite clear why. Um, it's the cover star of the uh, annual report this year because it did seem to make quite a comeback, which perhaps we weren't expecting. But again, with a lot of food plants getting very desiccated during the uh, second half of summer last year, it would be interesting to see how much breeding success they had. And come about May, when they start first start flying, um, it be interesting to see how many there actually are recorded. Chalk Hill Blue is something of a success. Again, I've compared this to 10 years ago in 2012, when it was very much restricted to the, the prime site up there in the north at Furfield Heath. Again, a big red blob at another of its prime sites, Hexton Chalk Pit, and um, smaller numbers are Albury Noahs. It's actually spread quite well. You can see that the Albury Noahs numbers have gone up a bit. The Hexton Chalk Pit numbers have gone up. And it established itself in 2013-14 um, at places like Ashworld Quarry. It's now um, got quite a strong colony on the land at Clothall Common, uh, where all the chalk spoil was dumped from the building of the A505, uh, the, the Bulldog Bypass. And that really is a good site for butterflies. Not many people seem to go up there. Um, it's freely accessible. It's a very pleasant walk. It gets a bit windy up on the top of the... Uh, the hill, but um, it really is a good site for butterflies because you can go up there, you can see chalk hill blue, you can see small blue, uh, lots of other butterflies, um, very accessible by car, by by public transport, it's only about a mile to walk from Bulldog Station. And uh, I know a lot of people don't don't seem to go up there, it's, it's well worth it. And one of the other reasons why it might be well worth going up there is this species, the Adonis blue, which, as you know, uh, we believe was probably released at Church Hill um, at Thurfield Heath a few years ago. Um, it's spread since spread all over Thurfield Heath. But I'd point out particularly that orange dot on the map, um, and that's linked to that rather fuzzy picture, which is the only one I could get of it, of one sitting on some golden rod on the, the aforementioned site. Um, so it appears to have been able to spread down the bypass. So um, there is a lot of um, horseshoe vetch growing on the Bulldog Bypass cuttings. So there's plenty of food, uh, food larval food plants for it. Um, so hopefully that will be another colony that grows up. Whether it has established itself naturally or whether there's been another release, I don't know. But a couple of observers uh, managed to find it up there. And although it probably breeds on the cutting edges, on the cutting sides, which are strictly out of uh, bounds, they're very high, very tall, very dangerous the dual carriageway down the bottom i wouldn't advise anyone to go scrambling down there it's very dangerous for all sorts of reasons the fact that i was able to see this one actually on the publicly accessible land means that as i mentioned earlier a good site to go and look for butterflies okay um so just to finish off the butterflies with the unusual ones that we're seeing every year there are a few unusual butterflies turn up and I just want to say a little bit about them. The uh, arrows on the map indicate which is the last year's record on the 2020 to 2022 maps. There were a few records of Camberwell Beauty in Eastern England last year, and there was probably an influx of migrants. So it's interesting that the two records in Hertfordshire are well away from the Eastern borders. So whether they were natural occurrences through migration, or whether they were bred somewhere or is who knows but it's very interesting to see to see where they do turn up each year the large tortoise shell uh, was seen by dave miller down at um, near heathrow airport you can see it was a very battered example um, but quite where that had come from we don't know i mean it's the large tortoise shell has attempted to recolonize britain on a number of occasions and i think there have been some breeding successes further south and east but whether it will ever recolonize Hertfordshire is difficult to know at the moment um the monarch down at the bottom there um right on the um border with surrey by the river 
no idea where that's come from. We get the odd monarch most years, um, but uh, whether they are released, they may well be releases. They may be migrants, but that, I'm not aware of a great migration of migrants, of monarchs migrating into Britain. And we're a long way from the places where they usually make landfall down in the southwest of the country. Long-tailed blue is interesting. You can see that there were several records uh, last year indicated by the arrows. Um, and they mostly seem to be in Middlesex, mostly in the east of the county. And it's difficult to know. Um, there have been colonies established. They, they found on the continent very commonly. And there have been colonies established on the south coast. And memorably, in I think it's 1996, there was a colony in, of all places, Gillespie Park in, near Finsbury Park in uh, Islington. Um, but equally, they're often imported as caterpillars or chrysalises in imports of beans and peas from um, East Africa. And sometimes they, they uh, develop in there and people have opened up beans and peas and uh, found, found um, a long tail blue in there. So the origin has to, has to remain a bit of a mystery. But um, it's interesting there were several last year, and it may be that they are beginning to get established in, in, East, in uh, Eastern Middlesex. Who knows? We shall see. But one worth looking at, and as you can see from the picture, it's quite distinct. It has does have these long tails and this the black spot at the end of the wing, uh, which makes it quite different from any of the other blue species that you might see. So let's move on uh, to moths. This will be a rather more um, a brief, quick run through moths because Colin Plant, who supplies the moth records, he's the moth recorder for Hart Presume Middlesex. As you might imagine, with the number of moth species there are, gets a vast number of records every year. And I receive them all and I, I do maps for the Hertfordshire Moth Group website. But it takes rather longer to browse through and coordinate all the records. So I'm afraid we haven't got a record, a full set of records for 2022 yet, but I can map for you. But this is just some information that he has been able to supply. And one of the things you notice about moths is the dynamism of the population compared to butterflies. You could say, Maybe it's in proportion to the number of moth species there are. But you can see um, there's quite a number of new species added to the Hertfordshire and Middlesex list every year. Um, many of them are fairly undistinguished uh, micro moths. But you can see there were a couple of um, much larger moths the mac listed under macros added to Hertfordshire last year and also um, to the Middlesex list. Um, some of those on the Middlesex list were already on the Hertfordshire list from uh, recent prior years. But it just, just goes to show how, how dynamic moth populations are. Um, some of these will probably have been overlooked because they're very small, but many of them are natural occurrences. They've actually almost certainly migrated from abroad or have migrated from other parts of Britain. So for instance, the light crimson underwing found in other parts of Britain and seems to be gradually with the dark crimson underwing um, and the Clifton Nonpareil gradually spreading, these are all related uh, moths in the Catacola group, spreading across uh, Eastern England. So it just shows that you, you never know with moths, if you're into moth trapping, you never know what you might find. It's unlikely you'll record a new species of butterfly, but there's every chance you might record a new species of moth in uh, Arpichir or Middlesex or even occasionally um, in the whole country, though that happens a lot less often. So I uh, also supplied this list of lost, almost certainly lost species. The V moth, which I've only ever seen one of, is actually a moth that eats black currants, red currants, or its larvae, it's those uh, fruit bushes. Um, and it's nat nationally in what appears to be possibly a terminal decline as you can see from the, from the records there. The pale shining brown um, is in national decline as well um, and is unlikely to, to be seen here again, I'm afraid. <clears throat> Blount's chestnut ditto. Um, and the dark barred twin spot carpet. Um, this and the, the, um, the red barred 
twin spot carpet are very sim can be very similar species. They can also be very different species. There's a tremendous amount of morphological variation in moth species, but it looks as if the dark barred twin spot carpet hasn't been seen this century in Hertfordshire or Middlesex. And both the magpie and puss moth, which says a staring county extinction in the face, they're very rarely recorded. Interestingly, the magpie moth, which always used to be a common moth, is another one whose caterpillars feed on red currants and black currants. Now, quite well that should be because they're still quite widely grown on allotments and in gardens. Um, whether it's to do with spraying, I don't know. I mean, I haven't recorded either moth in the garden. We've got plenty of black currant and red currant bushes, and we don't, we've never sprayed anything. So quite what the reasons are for these extinctions or near extinctions or long-term absences, perhaps a better way of putting it, who knows? So what I'm going to do now is just move through a number of illustrations of moths uh, in the county, which have either interesting migrants, haven't been seen recently, uh, sorry, haven't been seen in large numbers recently, or even new for the county in the last few years. And I think hopefully it will show you some of the variation in moths as well. And all the pictures in here are credited to the author, author of the record and the finder of and the taker of the picture. So this is the marble green from the 8th of August that Liz uh, found in her garden. This was actually initially identified <clears throat> as a strange form of um, tree life and beauty, but Liz was convinced it was not. And it went to Colin Plant who examined it in detail and came back and confirmed that it was indeed the marble green, a very rarely uh, recorded butterfly in Hertfordshire. White line dart um, from my garden in July. I actually caught another one as well. Is actually, and I hadn't recorded one of these ever before in um, 30 years of trapping uh, in Hertfordshire and Middlesex. Is found in one, at one or two other sites, but it's an extremely uh, rare moth these days. And uh, it may be that one or two more are turning up now, so maybe it is turning turning things around. But it's quite a distinctive moth um, when you actually find it. Lunar yellow underwing is what it looks very much like the other yellow underwing, so it has a much bolder black mark down at the bottom of the wing, the forewing, as you can see from the picture here. Um, and it has a, a different kind of marking. Uh, as the name's just lunar and yellow underwing, it has a sort of crescent moon mark on the yellow underwing, if you can persuade it to show you. And this is a, a rarely recorded species in, a, in our area. The plume fanfoot is a very is a pretty rare moth over most of the country. And this is another one that turned up with Liz um, during the autumn. And you'll notice a lot of the dates on these on the migrant moths are from the autumn. These are moths which don't necessarily are not so native to this country, don't even breed in this country. Um, <clears throat> but traditionally, October and November are the, are the months when moths, moth recorders get very excited because it's a time <clears throat> when if there are warm winds coming in from Europe or from Africa or off, uh, coming in off the south, off the Atlantic, up from the Azores or the Canary Islands, that they can sometimes blow in interesting moths. We call them migrants, so probably windblown um, vagrants is probably a better name for most of them because they don't have show strong migratory tendencies, i.e. coming here regularly breeding and then returning from whence they came. This is Ethmia quadrilella uh, from John Matson down in Spellthorn, down in the southwest of our area. This is a micro, but it's a, a beautifully marked piebald uh, micro, very rarely recorded. And this is Anania verbascalis uh, from Roger Millard up in Letchworth on the 3rd of August. Um, one of the larger micro moths, um, not dissimilar to, to some others in its group. And this was a small marble, which is a, a macro moth, though, despite it's probably smaller than some of the uh, micro moths that I'll show you. Uh, again, you can see the, the 3rd of October. 30th of October date, again, illustrating what I say about, about how a lot of these so-called migrants come in during the quite late autumn. 
This is Eurasiftia gilvata, which is a micro moth, uh, again, quite a large one. Um, and you can see it has a yellow underwing, rather like um, a micro version of some of the large yellow wing, large lunar yellow underwing moths that I was discussing earlier. And this was the first for Hertfordshire, though a number of them were seen across South uh, Eastern, Eastern England uh, during the year. There seemed to be an influx of them into uh, the country last autumn. And this is not such a, a rare migrant, but I include this because it's such a vibrant coloured uh, form of it. Sometimes it is this rather nice pink cerise colour. Sometimes it's a rather brown, the lines are rather brown here. But this, this is probably coming into this country more regularly than it used to in, in greater numbers. They're still not large numbers, but it's the most, most attractive and very distinctive little moth. And you can see again there the autumn date. And again, another one, Loxostagia, I still can't say, Sticticalis, which is um, another fairly large micro moth, not the most attractively colored one, but again, a September date for that. This was one that um, came up uh, from a, a Twitter report from Emma Pitcher, uh, Death's Head Hawk Moth, an adult. We have had reports of caterpillars of the Death's Head Hawk Moth, but it seems to be rarer to find the adult, not that I, at either life stage of their life, are they that common in uh, Hertfordshire and Middlesex. But of course, this is the famous um, famous skull and crossbones uh, thorax moth, um, which can enter bees, bees' nests and squeak to keep the bees away from it. One of the few moths that can make a noise. And you can see again there, we have the October date. And then we have um, a, a series here of hawk moths that all made their way to uh, Roger Millard's garden. Um, this is a striped hawk moth from the 24th of September. Slightly battered example, but um, still, still quite obviously what it is. Bed straw hawk, hawk moth from the 9th of August, uh, again from Roger's garden. Uh, closely related to the striped hawk moth, but most distinct, uh, distinctively marked. And of course, the great thing about all these hawk moths is not only are they attractively marked insects, but they're also big insects as well, which always makes it more exciting to catch one of the big migrants. And the convolvulus hawk moth, this is famous for coming, coming to gardens with Nicotiana, and you can see it has a very long proboscis, and it's a great picture that Roger managed to take of one actually coming up to the, um, the Nicotiana, uh, ready, ready to dip its tongue in to take nectar from the bottom of that long, long flower. Not, not so attractive as some of the other hawk moths because it's uh, very large and, and gray, though the thorax um, and abdomen are quite attractively marked in uh, pink, white, and black. And this is actually one of the biggest moths that you'll see in this country. And, Final moth of this selection, this was new for, for the county, is the passenger, the 8th of July from Dominic Coth. So this is a, an earlier one. And although it's basically brown and grey, the markings are very attractive. Um, and it'd be wonderful to see some more. I've never seen one of these in the flesh. And uh, that's a very brief summary of some of the more interesting moths that uh, came in during uh, 2022. So all it remains for me to say, apart from if you've got any questions you want to ask me, is it's now time to prepare for the takeoff of the uh, 2023 butterfly and moth recording season. And I hope that many of you will be sending in your records um, and that you have a great season uh, actually recording. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew, very much. That's very interesting. Um, hopefully it will enthuse everyone to go out next year, this year, I mean, and start looking around um, your local patches again. Um, has anyone got any questions that you would like to ask Andrew? Um, if you have, just um, unmute yourself and either put your hand up, or, well, yes, or put your hand up in the, uh, with the um, reaction. So fire away with any questions, please, or not. 
Anyone got any questions? Surely someone has a question. I, I must admit, I did actually record a VMOTH in Norfolk and I just checked my records and there were only four VMOTHs recorded in Norfolk last year. And that was quite exciting when I saw that. Um, yeah. They have declined. <clears throat> Sorry? I said it just shows how they have declined nationally. Yeah, yeah the, um, they were very pleased with my record. Yeah. So, um, you know, he said at the time it was the first one they'd had for the um, 2022, but I saw just now on the Norfolk Moths website, they had three more. Ah, there's a comment from Hillary saying, thank you, Andrew. That was very interesting. Okay. And also uh, for anyone, I have put up the links for the Members' Day on Saturday and the photo competition. So you're very welcome to vote in the photo competition. Annette. Ward says a really interesting talk as ever. Let's hope we have a good year this year. Mm. Fingers crossed. We must. We must. I mean, we had good weather last year, but not necessarily beneficial for the butterflies because also it became too hot to go out and look for them. Yeah, and I think it became too hot for the but well, not so, partly yeah. the butterflies, but also a lot of plants just don't release nectar when it's very hot. Now I was misting mine um during the day and i was able to well i did get white letter come down so um i think that maybe well i don't know whether misting does work but i did keep them misted on the hemp agrimony in particular uh corinne says always look forward to your talk hopefully lots more butterflies and moths in 2023 yes i think the moths i think people really should start getting to moths because they're so on so many people think they're brown and boring and from andrew's illustrations today you know full well they are not brown and boring not all of them anyway we have we have to admit a few are but there uh, are a few yes but then there's brown, brown and boring butterflies as well oh well, yes i think that's very true i mean um yeah i mean yeah i mean when you get inundated with several large yellow underwings and a few um well hot padrina things um do go oh i long for a magpie moth and i haven't i didn't have a magpie moth last year and the red current is right next to the trap mm -hmm. so yeah all right and uh, have we got i have a, i have a question oh, please so jenny please do talk um I'd be interested to know what that is on the on the opening slide. Oh, hang on. Uh, you That's mean, dark, your dark green. Dark green fritillary, yeah, on the actual title slide. Now, where it says time to prepare for the takeoff of the oh, twenty right. twenty three okay. season. Yeah. That was two two moths. The first one was a small elephant hawk moth. Ah, oh, okay. And this is um, a privet hawk moth. All right, lovely. Thank you. Should both be in most garden traps. I'll tell you another one to look out for, isn't it? The scarlet tiger? Yes. Yes, it's actually worth mentioning that because the scarlet tiger, um, until a few years ago, didn't see in this county much at all. Um, it was really Buckinghamshire and further west. It's gradually spread into um, Hertfordshire and they have been seen as far east as right over at Waterford near, uh, near me in East Hertfordshire, though not in great numbers. But I gave a talk at Purton uh, last autumn and I was talking about Scarlet Tiger and um, several people mentioned they'd had them in their garden and someone had recorded um, 10 examples in their garden Ooh. last last year. And obviously that's right over on the sort of northwestern side of the county. But there's no doubt that it is um, spreading in. And although we seem to have virtually lost the garden tiger, we've obviously gained the Jersey tiger. Um, and it looks like Scarlet Tiger is also going to join it. So I'm hoping that before long, um, both of them are, are seen across the whole county. Fingers crossed. My yeah, I mean, the Jersey said Tiger is still more common in the east of the county than the west, and vice versa for the Scarlet Tiger. So let's hope they can um, do a quick exchange. Yeah, my brother who lives in Ludlow sent me a photo of a caterpillar the other day. I don't do caterpillars, but I got the book out and thought, 
Oh, you Jemmy so so, you've just had a scarlet tiger on your borage. <laughs> he thought, oh, it's bound to be a boring moth. Uh -huh. No, it's scarlet tiger. Well, one, oh, one thing, I remember I had one in the garden last year. One thing that's worth remembering is <clears throat> that a scarlet tiger, one of its main caterpillar food plants is blue alkanet, <clears throat> which is certainly a major weed in my garden and yeah, seems to grow so, yeah. extremely well, pretty well everywhere across the county now. It seems to have become much more common. Um, and that may be one of the reasons why it is spreading because the, of the availability of the food plant. Um, and it's almost impossible to eradicate however much you try to in your garden. So it'd be nice to have a few scarlet tigers doing some natural eradication. Anyway, has anyone else got any, any, any questions? If not, I'm going to stop the recording shortly and um, say thank you again to Andrew for such an interesting talk. We will continue almost certainly to have a short programme of talks next spring. Um, they're always available on our YouTube channel. So if you do miss them, um, they're always, well, they're as they, we intend to record them every time. Um, but yes, we will almost certainly have another program next spring of talks. Um, it's just finding the topics. Uh, um, Andrew's is a regular talk because it's just before the season and it just prepares everyone um, looking, well, what to look for. Of course, Saturday is the start of the transit season, but thankfully the weather forecast is going to be rubbish. So you can all come to our members day instead. You don't have to go out. <laughs> and Paul Cross says, thanks, Andrew, very informative and well presented. There you go. Thank you. So I am going to stop the recording.